just had Skywatch about two weeks ago. We're going to have another Skywatch on Saturday at Northwest Riverport because of the scheduling conflict later in the month with the Halloween festivities out at the Northwest Riverport. And we generally don't have an issue in October because Jeff wants me to stay back there so I'll stay focused. Put some tape on the he, he yells at me for wandering about the room. Um, in the past, the East Coast Star Party consumed us on the end of October, so we usually canceled the Skywatch because of the East Coast Star Party. And we'll talk about East Coast Star Party in a second. But there's no East Coast Star Party this year, so we're on the hook for Skywatch, and it's going to be this Saturday. Right now, the cloud cover doesn't look too badly. It's not as clear as it was for the last one, but it looks like it's okay. Um, it's enough that I know for sure I'm going to go out there. I don't know if I'm going to go to Corner Park tomorrow. I don't even know what the weather report. Does anybody know what the weather report for tomorrow is? Looks at it. Windy. Windy. It's supposed to cool down. Temperatures are dropping. Partly oh, yeah. cloudy. Fronts coming in. Children, yeah. frick, yeah. children fricking mosquitoes. Yeah. 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 So. That's the schedule. Um, there's a bunch more on the schedule, but I'm not remembering. I'm sure there's a Garden Stars. Yeah, Garden Stars is October 8th. October 8th. And then we've been that Saturday. We also have Saturday on Sunday, or Sunday on Saturday. October 12th is uh, Sunday, Saturday, Sunday. Saturday on Sunday. We have anything, and then Night Watch is later, right? Uh, or night watch will be October the twenty sixth. Twenty sixth. That's it. That's Chip a, Oaks. That's a Chip Oaks. That's a members only event too. Sky Watch for the for new people is a public thing. We go and set up telescopes on the out in the Northwest River Park in Chesapeake, and the public's invited. And it's free. You can come and look at. We were inundated with people last time. Last Sky Watch they had. They decided to schedule. I don't even know who it was that was there, but the whole freaking part. Oh, I know. Morale, Welfare, and Rec had scheduled for the um, annex that's down on Blackwater. There's a Navy base down there that does scoop stuff and all that. Anyway, they scheduled their morale, morale MWR picnic for that weekend at the Northwest River Park. So when we got there, there were hundreds of people there already. The parking lot was filled. And I had to go play butthead and tell them you guys need to move all your cars out of the parking lot because this is ours. You can park wherever you want, but the parking lot is ours to set up telescopes. And then they gave me a lot of grief and then I suggested to them, well, let's call Kevin Call, the head of Parks and Recreation, and let him explain to you who has the longevity and who, who gets what. And they were like, well, no, we don't need to, we don't need to disturb Kevin Call on Saturday afternoon. Just give us the parking lot, we'll share our telescopes, everybody can come over and look and we'll all be one big happy family. Chuck, will you adopt me? Huh? <laughs> Do I adopt you? No, I already have one 39 year old living in my house with my children. Would you like to have her? Do you have her? <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking to get rid of her. <laughs> anyway, so it ended up, Skywatch ended up being a good thing. And I haven't heard anything about this Saturday. If there's anything special going on this Saturday, I kind of, I don't know. I was going to call Kevin tomorrow, get a call and see if there's anything going on. Is that tomorrow? Saturday. Is that Saturday? Saturday? Yeah. International Observe the Moon? Yeah, tomorrow. actually, I think it would be the official day. Not, not, not really weekend. Weekend. One, is it? <laughs> anyway, so we might be inundated. We might be inundated with people for that. Actually, there's going to be moon. We'll have at least first quarter moon, I think. Yeah, yeah. it's out tonight. Thanks for it's out Saturday. tonight, you know. Oh, why don't you sit down? So, Chuck, why don't you sit down? <laughs> I want to sit here. There's a seat right here. I'll fall here, asleep. I've been up since 3 o'clock. Well, don't, don't move. I think you should just aim the camera at Jeff's head. Why don't you just turn it to the audio? Yeah, Never you. mind. Because you're really not going to put me on the internet. On Never you. mind. If you are. Yeah, did you get him off, uh, please? <laughs> Never mind. Sorry, there's children in here, watch out. Sorry. <laughs> Not that move. <laughs> and live feed on Skynet, man. Go. I have some new business, man. Get through. Okay. So, anybody have any questions so far? Do you guys have a telescope? Not yet. We were hoping to get some advice on the, 
Star Wars. Star Wars. Yeah, don't buy anything. Don't buy anything. There'll be a whole bunch. Of, we, we, that's our advice. <laughs> yep. Just don't go buy a telescope. Do not until you go look through a whole bunch of other people's telescopes and you see what you like. We will have, we will have telescopes all the, out there all the way from small refractors, which are the ones with lenses in it and stuff, all the way to reflectors, which use mirrors and sometimes mirrors and lenses. All right, so we'll have anything. We'll have stuff out there probably anywhere from 100 millimeter refractors all the way up. I'll bring my 18 inch reflector, which is mirrors. Okay, that'd be something that everybody does. Right, right. Well, <laughs> well, there's two. There's many different types of telescopes. Have you been looking at all? A little bit, but I figured I would wait till I listen to people who actually okay. do it for well, a while. Just start party. Come out, come out to the to the North Coast yep. River Park. Even if it's iffy weather, because some of us will still be there. And if it's iffy weather, we can show you a lot about telescopes. <laughs> right. And we might be able to see something fancy. Right. This. I would say that there will be a high chance we'll see Jupiter, Saturn, and, Ma and the Moon really well. And, and my Saturday. other question with that is how, what time should I show up so I'm not stumbling in there and, and ruining everybody's night? I would get there a little bit before dusk. Between yeah, dusk and dark. I'll be there an hour before okay. sunset. Right, Bill? M33 is what I'm doing. M33? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You can get there early and chase all those other people away, right? Yeah, that's that's what happened last time. It took me an hour to get the Phoenix parking lot. You can get crazy. It's never a cattle ride. <laughs> <laughs> what they don't know is that I did have my nine minutes. Oh, you bring one of the Rottweilers, too. Yeah, I bring a dog. You know, my dog, they were just licking everybody. Right? <laughs> Rottweilers are racing. They're racing. Um, it's a good thing. You'll learn a lot. You'll see different telescopes. You'll go, oh my god, that's way too expensive. And, oh, <laughs> um, and oh my god, there's a lot of mosquitoes here. Yeah. <laughs> actually, well, that, actually, area, hopefully that. there'll be less than there was last week. I, last week wasn't too bad. I sprayed up and it wasn't too bad. But um, I didn't get out of there until after midnight. We, there were so many people I did. I started breaking down the big one about 11.30 and said, that's it, I'm done, I got it. So, and that's long. I mean, we the sun went down about, I think it got dark about seven-ish, a little bit after seven, so about eight. So we had four hours of, of good darkness. It's not as dark as it was 10 years ago, but it's still dark. So uh, anyway, that's what I have for that. Um, as far as new business, my mat like memory is not popping in. So, talking about East Coast Star. Oh, East Coast Star. Remember, we have a member of the club. His name is Kent Blackwell, and he has a relationship with a campground down in North Carolina. And normally, he does a star party twice a year in the, in the spring, usually around Mother's Day, and then in the fall. Usually on Halloween, he likes to have a Halloween contest to get dressing up and stuff like that. So, but what happened was this year, somebody or last year, somebody bought the campground and they're and they're redoing the campground. All right, they're not done yet. They were supposed to be done in May, but they're not done yet. So there'll be no East Coast Star Party again this fall, and he's not real certain if it's going to be done enough in time to have one in May either. So. He's pretty disheartened. He's disheartened because he's had a, a continuous star party down there for what 26 years or something like that, twice a year. So, yeah, it's it's a wait and see type of thing to see how it goes because it's all new management of the campground and they're trying to make it a. It used to be a redneck campground, to, for lack of a better words, you know. Now it's not going to be a redneck campground. They're thinking it's going to be some kind of an upscale campground. Their rates are twice what they used to be. The people that used to camp down or not camp, but have a trailer down there all the time, instead of a couple hundred, two thousand dollars a year, now it's almost four or five thousand dollars a year to keep it down there. So there's a lot of issues going on. With it. And, uh, but they're still the people who own the campground are very interested in maintaining the star park. So that's what we have as far as keeping our fingers crossed. Um, 
Um, there are other star parties going on. When is, isn't the... Uh, 21st. Staunton uh, River starts when? 21st. 21st. If you really got to go to a star party, go to Staunton River. Bob's been to the Staunton River Bar Star Party. I've never been. But he's been. That's a pretty good star party. Is that close to Stanton River? Stan. Stan. Just say that. The U is silent. Because <laughs> if you go to Stanton, Virginia, they pronounce it Stanton. State Park? It's so not Newport News either. Stanton River State Park, 180 miles. Bottom Top Town West here on Route 1. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right, that's where I've heard it's where I have yet to be. No there. mosquitoes, right? No, they are not. I'm sure there's a bunch. Yeah, it's from the great school. Okay. <laughs> What's your new business, Mr. Gordon? The new business is the Transit of Venus, November the 11th. The Transit of Mercury. The Transit of Mercury. I, I, I blew it. Okay. I blew it. The transit of Mercury. I've been passing the sheets out by, while you're rambling. It says the transit of Mercury here, but anyway, it's the transit of Mercury. We had originally talked with. I mean, think about it. It'll roll around in a roll decks in a minute. Um, the guy who does the planetarium and Bob's Chuck. middle school. Chuck. Chuck Gibbs. That's Chuck Gibbs. Right. He's our link to the city to get down on the boardwalk. Chuck had mentioned that they were planning on something at the boardwalk on <coughs> November 11th. On November 11th, which happens to be Veteran Monday. Day. Yeah. What's the time? Day. You know, what's the time of the train? Well, uh, it cool. starts. It starts at sunrise. Yep. So oh, that's about. Well, about not exactly. It's, it's, so, it's a little after sunrise. It's about. It goes to about two, one thirty or so. It's about eight right. degrees the above the horizon. Was, right. The last one was pretty good. So. That was one of the things I'm going to do tomorrow, is I'm going to call Chuck Dibbs and ask him if he has made arrangements for us to go to the city and be on the boardwalk like we were for the last one. We were there for the last Mercury, which was in May of 2012. 2012. Is that long ago? Yeah. So it was Venus, do 2012. That, <laughs> Venus if, if we don't have the boardwalk, Who's counting? we're going to have to find somewhere else that has Low Eastern Horizon. Like Mount Trashmore. Mount Trashmore's got a nice horizon. If you climb up on the mountain. Okay. Buckrow's going to let you drive your car up here? Buckrow B is, Buckrow has a Western Horizon. Do they have an Eastern no, Horizon? No, East, East, East. Oh. East. Yeah, east. Buckrow. Buckrow Beach has East, well, South, actually South. Huntington, that's the one I'm thinking. Huntington is where we So Buckrow east. Beach has a good Eastern Horizon. Yeah. I know that if I go all the way out to, at the corner of basically a oh, damn Hold still, Chuck. Princess Anne, oh, Princess Anne and um, Sandbridge or whatever, there's some spots out there that we could go to where we have a really good Eastern Horizon. Or we could go to Sandbridge or something. What's wrong with Boardwalk? Huh? Boardwalk. Well, we got to get permission to be there from Chuck Dibbs and the city. Last time we showed up at the boardwalk for the Venus Transit, the first one, people got 60 and 70 and $100 parking tickets for parking where they shouldn't be. And, and cited for being on the boardwalk before seven o'clock. Because the Virginia Beach police are just so accommodating. Um, so we, don't want, we want to avoid that. But, that's one of the things I have to take for um, action is find out where the heck we're going to be for that. So we got about a month and a half, month and a half two months for that. And, one month um, and a few days. Five, five, six weeks. Five, six weeks, yeah. And um, it'll be fun to image it again. So, yeah. so that's that's new business. I'd it'll like be, to head up the um, the software section and uh because i've already started some software, software and section. Oh, is this for, the for the award i've got yeah, the yeah. uh handout does anybody they, uh, not have a handout yeah, has, the yeah. has the astro league to set up a deal already yeah the al has an award for planetary transit i've got a copy for you i got copies for everybody i'd like to make a presentation next week next next month for the uh, uh november meeting and uh, i'll 
I'll be further along with my uh, spreadsheet. We've got it all in spreadsheet. I did the spreadsheet last year also for uh, what this one. Yeah. Did a spreadsheet also last Everybody year for the, signed in. For the um, eclipse. eclipse. And uh, three of us got the award for the eclipse. Bird, me, and I forget who it was. Oh, that's right. For Venus or for Venus? Well, I got one for Venus. I'm talking about eclipse. And Mercury. AL Awards. Okay. I got one for Mercury. All right. But anyway, back Jeff, to the subject. The planetary <laughs> Venus. I'd like to do a presentation next month, if it's okay with everybody, uh, and present what we have to do for the award, okay. you know. And uh, I'll, be, I'll be glad to go through and, and answer questions because I've done a lot of the work already. There's some software you have to download. I've got a lot of it on my website, www.jeffgold.net. You can download the software, all that I've, <coughs> all that I've downloaded so far. Um, Jeffgold.net. Jeff Thank you. Pretty tough. <coughs> Hard to remember that. That's why I'm right Jeff I know. Jeffgold.net. <laughs> right on the front page, it says uh, Transit of Mercury 19, 2019, something like that. How come it's not gold? <clears throat> anyway, uh, and it's, a, it's zipped up. It's about uh, 15K or something like that, 15 meg. And you download it, it's got a little folder in there. It's got some software you download. To, but you, you have to have the oblateness of the, of the sun, and the, you know you have to do all kinds of extra calculations and, and figure out. They you know. can't make it easy. Oh, it's not easy. It's just like when we went to the AO thing down in Florida. Right, it's they not easy. They wanted us to observe 127 objects off the, off the ship. Right. right. It's moving like this. Shooting all you've got, out. all you've got, is binoculars. They finally decided, okay, if you get these twelve, we'll give you the award. But if it's worthwhile doing, it's it's worthwhile doing. If, if you want to get a pin, it's easy to do with the software and go through the procedures. I will pass your information about offering to the board. presentation to. I've already ch I checked with George, and he he wants to do it, and he's going to bring it up with the board too. Well, I'll send it to the press. Okay. Because he's the one that schedules the presentations. Check. Okay. And I'm sure that George may have been involved with that too. So thank okay. you, Jeff. We'll make sure. Check. Th thank you very much, buddy. Appreciate yes, sir. And we'll find In the meantime, out. We'll find, try and find out what we're going to do with the board, with the boardwalk, or where we're yeah. going to go. You can look ahead, look at the software, to see what you have to do. Say, well, I don't want any part of this, or. Yeah, I'd like to do this. It's only going to take a couple hours. Um, Let's do it. How long is your presentation? 20 minutes. 30 minutes. 20 minutes? Oh, good. I get to yeah. Oh, his. Yeah. <laughs> Anybody got observing reports? I can see. I got an observing report for you. All right, Mr. All right. Um, on July 2nd, my wife Patty and I were down in uh, this little town named Tombo in the Elkie Valley in Chile, and we got to see the solar eclipse. Chile? That's a that's a string bean country. You, yeah, you, you, like right. That's a, that that shit. The one that has like one, like humidity of like minus eight. It was or it was, like was it was a it was very nice weather down there. Anyway, we had a great time. Um, got to take some videos and pictures, and hopefully I can schedule a presentation for ten minutes or so sometime to uh, show some of it and just tell you a little more about it so you can kind of see what it was like. But it was a lot of fun. It was um, a lot of people there. It was a, it was an organized tour. And um, so it was, it was well planned, you know. We were out on this soccer field, and uh, like I say, it was up in the Elkie Valley, which is pretty dry. And it was, it, they found a place where there were hills right in front of the sun, so you could see the sun and then Venus get down just setting, you know, during the eclipse. It was very cool. Yeah, that's pretty. And we also went up to uh, Cerro Tololo Observatory for a tour up there, and then when we were up in Peru, um, we got. When we were in the Sacred Valley, we uh, got to uh, the, the hotel where we were all staying, turned off the lights behind the hotel. So we went out there, Jay Anderson, who was the meteorologist on this uh, trip, um, did a little tour of the southern sky for everybody. Because like me, nobody, very few of the people had ever been to the southern hemisphere before. So this is all like a new world to us. You get to see the Southern Cross. Got to see, the, I took pictures of the Southern Cross and Alpha Centauri. And, Scorpius and Sagittarius were overhead. 
Hmm. So I'm wow. taking pictures of that stuff. It was amazing. I just it was a totally different view of the, of the sky. That's that's but anyway, that's my observing report. Cool. Awesome. Like anybody else is gonna see. Take pictures of Cool. Sensitive to the presentation. I wrote you down for a present. Alright. Anybody else for offering an observing report? Awesome. Okay, me, 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 me. I bought a new map. Shocking. Shocking. Trying to catch up with Ken. Um, my Ioptron little cube mounts that I use for the solar and stuff, they're starting to, they're like eight to 10 years old, so they're starting to go, motherfuck, right? And mess up. So I was looking for a replacement. I've been looking for a long time. Mead came out with this new thing called an LX65. And they came out with it in like January, but you couldn't buy one because they were back ordered and all this stuff. So I finally found Astronomics out of Oklahoma and said they had one in stock. So I ordered one. When they say in stock, that means that they have um, they have the ability to send it from me in direction. So I ordered one and it took them like 12 days to get it to me. But I got it on Monday. They're expecting it to be, it's about this tall. It has a, uh, I put a picture of it on the Facebook site. It has a, um, Vixen type dovetail on both sides. It has a single arm. It has a Vixen dovetail on both sides, so you can mount two scopes. On the primary side, you can put 14 pounds, and on the other side, you can put seven for a maximum of 21. So the idea is to put the solar scope, the hydrogen alpha on the main side, and then put a little 70 millimeter with my solar funnel on the other side. And I expect it to have nothing but trouble and functions most my experience with me go to has been frustration <laughs> um they are past that now i took it out put my uh um i took i hooked an 80 millimeter refractor to it took it outside did a rudimentary just yeah i think that's north yeah that looks level did, a, did an alignment using a 40 millimeter eyepiece, right? Yeah, that looks like it's in the center. And told it to go to Saturn, right? Zoom, <laughs> put it right in the center, mm. right? Like, boom, boom, boom. So we filled with it during the night and the go-tos were just right in the center of that, right? So night before last, I went out and did an alignment with like a 12 millimeter reticle and my go-to's were within a 12 millimeter, I, my 12 millimeter nice. negra, everything was within there, right? So I'm duly impressed with it. It was 495 bucks for the mount, okay? It comes with a, it's go-to, it doesn't have a GPS, and it doesn't have, um, what's the other thing it doesn't have? Eh, it doesn't have, it doesn't have GPS, it doesn't have Wi-Fi or anything like that, it's just, I go to home. And, uh, and all I did was enter in the zip code where I was. I didn't enter a lot long or anything like that, just the zip code. So I am, I almost have to stop talking badly about me. <laughs> <laughs> so it worked well. I don't know if I'm a lone wolf and got a good one, but it, I'm very happy with it. And I'll have it at the Sunday thing, the Saturday Sunday thing this month. And I probably will take it to Skywatch too, just to just to show it off and show that that it works. Um, the other night we had it was Tuesday night about eleven o'clock at night on my twelve and a half inch. I took Saturn up to almost five hundred power on it. It was just steady as a rock. I took it at one o'clock and went away. You know, just to see it the, the hell. But it was really good. So. I was looking at the moon too. I found a feature on the moon that I'm not real certain about. It looks like a crater with two um, tunnels, not tunnels, but half pipes going into it. Aliens. Yeah, aliens. <laughs> and I can't find the feature on any of the maps. So now I gotta wait for this for the moon to get in the same phase that it was that night that I observed it <laughs> and see if I can find it again. If I can find it again. Then my first choice is to go find George, who's a lunatic that knows everything that's on the moon, basically. Say, George, what the heck is this, right? 
And so if he's at Skywatch, I might be able to better find him. So anyway, that's my observation point. Okay. Number one, do we have any other one? Pretty good evening. Pretty good evening the weekend before. Uh, I was observing in East Beach, so it's kind of like the thing here. Uh, oh, uh, Jupiter and Saturn, both are in. Uh, Jupiter's moon, you see all four of them. Oh my fucking god, is that real? Yeah. Are you serious? That's not a picture? <laughs> put your hand in front of the scope, yeah. put your coat in front of the scope, you have to deal with this stuff. So every now and then you get one of those. We had quite a few of those at Skywatch the other night. Has anybody seen Neptune yet? You saw it the other night or what? Yeah, when it was close. Through, Actually, through the night scope? after it was the closest. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was yeah. good. I'm still. A year or so ago, back when I had the 20 inch, for some reason I had convinced in my mind that I seen Triton in the 20 inch from my driveway in, in Greenbrier, right? So I've been looking for it to see if I can see it with the 18 inch, right? And at Skywatch, I finally, what is it? David Reed set up next to me. He goes, I don't think you saw it at all. He says, the magnitude is da 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 da. And I said, the oh. I was like, oh, yeah. <laughs> well, he didn't go, eh. he didn't have glasses. <laughs> but he was giving me a lot of grief about, because I was yapping about trying to find it. And he goes, you ain't going to see it. Even with that 18 inch, you ain't going to see it. So then I started looking up what my limitations were. And so then I went looking for faint stars. I spent the rest of the night almost <laughs> looking for show. faint stars. I went to M103. <laughs> it's a mission at that point. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, went to, I went to various things where I knew that there were little dim stars in yeah. and came to the conclusion that that, I think it was a 15 point something magnitude is Triton. Best I'm seeing at Skywatch is 13.5 maybe at the most. So. I can I can resi have resigned myself that I did not see Triton in Greenbrier. I must have seen a star in the background that was close and convinced myself that it was Triton. So anyway, I've been chasing that for a year. It's like fuck. <laughs> <laughs> no canals on Mars. That's a good, uh -huh. that's a good yeah. story. Yeah, and uh, David David Reed didn't go. We'll just say. You know, October's, a, October's a good outreach for ourselves. We can have our own outreach with uh, Halloween coming up. Right. And, uh, you know, the trick or treaters can come well, through our is, scopes there too. There is, George put out, that's glad you said that because that just pops up more than that, really. George has put out a, uh, an event somewhere. I think, it has, I think it's tied to some church somewhere that wants us to bring telescopes out on Halloween to look at stuff. And I told him that I would not be attending because I always set up my telescope on the front yard. Right. Yeah. Like the kids Me too. The telescope before Try to. Candy. <laughs> I, I did that on the 400th anniversary of Galileo. Yeah. So I let my beard grow for a couple of years. <laughs> I got my black graduation gown. I made a squared collar. I was out there with a refractor and the kids would come up and go, would you like to look at my telescope? Guess who I am? Every one of the kids said a pilgrim. <laughs> 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 I hope you gave out Mars bars. <laughs> My favorite picture is the picture of the little tiny Mars bar, and then the yeah. background is the Milky Way bar. Yeah. It says the oh. the Milky Way from Mars. <laughs> <laughs> One of my non-astronomy friends sent me that, that picture. All right, if we don't have anything else, we'll turn it over to. Yeah, oh, new business? New business. Um, two questions. One, uh, what's the status of the raffles? Tickets. Raffle tickets, that's true. I didn't bring that up. We have a raffle this year. The raffle will, will include on our anniversary party in December, which I'm not remembering where it's at, or even if Jordan set it up yet. I sure hope he has. Um, what we're giving off, giving away is 
um, a, a Ryan eight inch dom. Um, no go to or anything like that, but it's an Orion um, XT8 Plus, which means it has a couple enhancements over the old XT8s. It has an improved tension system to keep it nice and tight so you can move it around. It has a dual speed focuser with a 10, 11 to 1 ratio on the focuser. It comes with a 2 inch. I steering, I'm Super blue for shoes. Right here, we'll um, it comes with a uh, an observer's guide, a planetsphere, a flashlight, a moon map, and also a uh, inch and a quarter uh, moon filter, and also an observer's book that I'm throwing in that I got from Barnes and Noble. It's pretty good. It's like a freaking observer's book. And that's a rule. That's I, I'm my opinion. This is the this is the best thing that we've given away as far as a telescope for Georgia June. Um, tickets are five dollar donation, and I have difficulty in picking them up buying. Um, we also are are giving away a Canon 7D pic camera that has been modified by Happy Griffin for actual photography. Um, half, he gave us the, um, he gave us half off on the modification of the camera. So that's like about a $180 give it, you know, and, and I paid for half of it, but the club paid for the other half of the, of the, of the modification. So we're giving that away too, and that's a, that's a $5 donation as well. So we're hoping to raise some cash for our, Georgia, for our scholarship programs. Right now, it's, it's part of it. It's part of it's, it. Our handouts, I was looking all over my computer before I came here for my piece of paper I made that was a handout for the tell up that, that explained everything that we're getting or giving away. I couldn't find it, so I will get it for the next meeting. So we still have a few months to sell the tickets, and it's it's a really good the camera. If, if you're into astro imaging or thinking that you're going to get into astro imaging, the camera includes. A two inch nose piece to go into your focuser. Um, there's no lenses included, it's just a body with that nose piece. Battery, two batteries, I think, maybe. Um, I can't remember if there's a power supply that goes with it or not. There might be. But it's a really good camera. It's a really, really good camera. And uh, the telescope is a really good telescope. Normally, by now, I would have put it together and tested it. But I haven't put it together because I got a whole bunch of telescopes in my garage right now for some other reason. Probably in a month or two I might take it out and put it together. But then again, I might not. You know, I might just let them put it. Together. So when is the when is the the holiday party in December? Is when we're gonna get last year it's stripers. Is it stripers? Last year. No, last year stripers. So you're saying this year? This year so, in December. So we only have like a month and something. Yeah, a little more. Okay. All right. Was better than plenty uh, time. We got the scope in May last time. This and we got it in May. And all it. Anyway, okay. So anyway, those the tickets are there. Buy tickets. If anybody wants to buy tickets, like I said, I have tickets here. If you don't have cash, guess what? The club takes plastic now. He's got the so machine. We have the square machine that works pretty good. Um, if I remember how to use that, in use it two minutes. But that's what we say. Anybody else have anything before we turn it over to our So let me add the, the next oh. piece of that, folks. We have some new people. Um, <clears throat> we have the Back to Amateur Astronomers for years now has had a uh, two scholarships programs. The Back to Amateur Astronomers main scholarship program, which is fifteen hundred dollars last year, and uh, the George June Memorial Scholarship Program, uh, which is five hundred. So the scholarship committee met, um, and we're going to repeat that for next year. The close-off date will be May 1st. Everything has to be uh, received, postmarked uh, in our post office box by May 1st. And two lucky uh, recipients from local high schools in the region, so I, well, basically Hampton Roads region, um, will get those two scholarships. So it's pretty substantial uh, for our size club and for what we have. So the good news is that your donations, because the uh, Back Bay Amateur Astronomers is a non-for-profit organization, it's, it's a corporation, it's got the 5013C educational organization, so 
it's a direct tax write-off. So don't know what your brackets are, but you can write off your taxes. So it's a you know great great cause, great organization, and does really good for students going off to go off to college in the sciences. So um, the tickets help for that. You can just write a check on that. You can go on the website and donate and allocate to either one of the scholarships. So, so you know, coming towards the end of the year, um, tax planning and that kind of stuff, just uh, corporate donations are accepted, employers, all that good stuff. So please uh, contribute to that good cause. Thank you. Okay. Someone's on an envelope on my desk. I don't know what's going on. Oh, these were good samples. <laughs> Yes. Solar Eclipse 2017. So I must have a piece of paper in that tells me who they belong to. Because mm. everybody, back when we did the Solar Eclipse in 2017, there was a bunch of people that foolishly followed me to um, um, Charleston? South Carolina. Charleston? No. No, it wasn't Charleston. We went down Charleston. to uh, Andrew, uh, Anderson? Anderson, South <laughs> yeah. Carolina. Distinct shape. Um, and uh, this is a common occurrence in synchronously rotating satellites. So the moon, of course, faces the Earth all the time. Its rotation is synchronized with its orbit. This is very common in the solar system. All of the big Jovian satellites, all of the big Saturnian satellites, even the medium-sized ones, are all locked uh, to their primaries. And um, this triaxial ellipsoid shape is actually a consequence of that. The flattening comes from the rotation. So an object, a spherical object, once we start it spinning, actually begins to flatten. The equator will bulge out, the poles will squeeze in, um, and so that's a consequence of rotation. The Earth does that. Uh, as an example, uh, more than 15 kilometers worth of, of excess uh, radius at the uh, equator versus the poles. So we call that the flattening of the Earth. Now, because the moon is tidally locked to the Earth and constantly keeps one face to the Earth, it's always high tide on the Earth side of the moon. It's always high tide on the far side of the moon, and it's always low tide everywhere else in between on the sort of edges of the visible part of the moon. And so as a consequence, because that tidal pattern doesn't move like it does on the Earth, right? From the Earth's point of view, the high tide comes, the high tide goes, the high tide comes, the high tide goes. Over time, that all averages out to zero. On the moon, that pattern is fixed. And so the moon has deformed such that it is now bulging out towards the Earth and away from the Earth and is getting squeezed in on the waist in between. So those two deformations, the squashing due to rotation and then this elongation in the direction of the Earth, is what leads to the triaxial shape. So three different sizes for the shape of the moon. Um, and we can do a little bit of theory. Don't be afraid of the math here. It's actually going to turn out to be pretty simple. Um, we can do a little bit of theory on what that shape should be in detail. Because we know what the gravitational field of a tide-raising object like the Earth is. We know what the perturbing potential of rotation is, we can, we can turn the centripetal force, if you like, into a potential. And so we can determine the shapes of the equipotential surfaces, which, given enough time, should be the shape of the body, because it should gradually flow until its surface matches an equipotential, as long as it doesn't have some sort of permanent elastic strength that can resist that. So when we put the rotational potential, which is this one, and the tidal potential together for a synchronous satellite, they are very closely related because you might notice gm over a cubed, Kepler's third law, is related to the period, which would be one over omega squared. And so we can combine these two into one expression, and the two parts of the shape the flattening, that's this 2-0 term, and the football, that's this 2-2 two, two term, have a fixed ratio. It's just the ratio of two constants. What you'll notice here is A is gone from this equation. It does not matter how far the moon is from the Earth. That ratio should remain the same. And so it should be 10 thirds. And we can measure this directly for the moon, all we have to do is put something in orbit around the moon. Because the deformed moon has a deformed gravity field. 
And if we track something in orbit around the moon, it will follow the deformed gravity field, and a careful enough tracking will tell us what the shape of that gravity field is, and therefore what the shape of the moon is. So when I'm referring to the shape of the moon, I'm actually talking about the shape of the gravity field of the moon, but that comes from the distorted actual shape of the moon. Okay, so the two are basically interchangeable. Yeah? What's the little r squared and k r squared? So the little r here, this is, this, you could evaluate this potential anywhere, inside the body, on the surface. Big R is the surface radius. So here it's evaluated at the surface. Is this assuming a homogeneous interior? This has nothing to do with the interior. This is the forces. We haven't talked about the response yet. We're going to get to that in a second. Okay, this is the forcing on the moon. How the moon responds does very much depend on how the mass is distributed within the interior. But it's going to turn out not to matter for this process. <laughs> Um, so this is a visual example of this. The moon, right, like any gravitationally pulled together object, should be a sphere. It wants to be a sphere. But it's got these perturbations, these non-spherical potentials acting on it. And so instead, it's going to flow out to fill out that non-spherical shape. And um, it's going to have this non-spherical shape and non-spherical gravity field. And the way we parameterize this is... We say that the, the non-spherical part of the gravity field is related, linearly related, with this constant called K2 to the um, imposed force on it. This is basically a Hooke's law. We say the response is some linear function of the force, right? For a spring, the deformation is some linear function of the force. F equals kx, okay? So k in this case is kind of like the spring constant. This is a way of thinking about how does this body respond to these non-spherical forces. We're just going to say it's linear, which is probably okay, as long as these forces are kind of small. But we've done this measurement. And if you recall, the theory said the ratio should be 10 thirds, or 3.3. Instead, it's 10. Actually, it's so that's kind of wrong. How is the moon so off from this equilibrium shape? There's only one way for that to be. The moon is resisting through elastic strength in its shell, is resisting deforming into the equipotential shape. It is in a very non-equipotential shape. And that tells us a couple things right away about the moon. Number one, it's cold and strong because a warm, gooey moon would after four and a half billion years, have flowed out into this shape. And so instead, it is somehow resisting that deformation. This tells us there's a lot of strength inside the moon. Um, it also tells us that this is not a fossil shape. That the moon, as far as we know, has been a synchronous rotator for a long, long time. So the moon is not recording, and remember, it doesn't matter where the moon is, whether it's close to the Earth or far away, that ratio should still be 10 thirds. But for some reason, it's off by a factor. So we're not seeing the fossil of a synchronously rotating object. However, when the moon formed, it should have been hot and gooey. The moon formed by smashing together a whole bunch of little rocks. That really should have heated it up. It should have molten and been molten and really soft. So it should have come, uh, it should have taken up some equilibrium shape after effect at some point but it evidently wasn't a synchronous equilibrium shape. So let's explore some alternatives. <coughs> oh, I, some other people have explored some alternatives but I'm going to ignore them because I don't think they're right. <laughs> so let's talk about another alternative. What if the moon remembers what it was like before it became a synchronous rotator. What if somehow the moon was able to record by stiffening enough its shape prior to synchronization? We're gonna, in a minute, come up with a big objection to this, which we're gonna have to resolve. But what if it was able to do that? Well, then as the moon cooled prior to synchronization, it should have only experienced flattening. Because if the moon is rotating relative to the Earth, then the tides are going up and the tides are going down and they cancel each other out. And we don't get the football part, we just get the flattening. 
Okay, so we're going to flatten the moon a little bit. This J2 is a measure of the flattening of the moon, and we're going to say that it's, again, this is sort of the linear spring constant, K2, and phi there is the potential. So that's the rotational potential. It's going to depend on how fast was the moon spinning at this particular time. So we're going to say the moon be began to be able to record that. But if the moon cools off in a funny shape, if I then take away the potential, it doesn't go back to spherical. It actually wants to stay in that funny shape because that's the shape it cooled in. That's the zero stress state for it. That's the state it wants to go back to at any time in the future. So after synchronization, it's actually gonna be trying to go back to this shape, not back to a sphere. So we're gonna come back to this in a second. Okay, now we're gonna stop the moon from rotating relative to the Earth. We're gonna synchronize it at some distance from the Earth. We don't know where that is just yet. In that case, the deformation is equal to the flattening we initially put on it, that it initially managed to record, plus the change in the flattening due to this later rotational state, this later synchronous rotational state. So that's why the difference term here. Okay, that's the flattening term. Now we got the football. We've synchronized it. The Earth is now going to start to elongate the moon. And it's going to produce C22, which is the football part of the shape. Again, a nice linear relationship. There's our three tenths, or the ten thirds flipped over. Okay. So at synchronization, it begins to try to adopt the synchronous shape, the ten third shape, but it's got a little memory of that pre synchronous shape. And so we can put all of these things together and write what the J2C22 ratio should be after this has happened. It depends on two things. It depends on there being a difference between how fast it was rotating when it first remembered its shape and how fast it was rotating when it synchronized. That's this ratio. It also depends on these two numbers. It depends on that response being different. In other words, it can remember its shape once, and then later, when we try to make it remember the new shape, it's actually stronger. It's <laughs> resisting that new shape more than it did before. And so in fact, this F here stands for fluid. This is the shape it would adopt if it were perfectly liquid. It has no strength to resist it. This is the, is the spring constant later on in its life. And so this is actually going to resist that deformation more. And so that's why there's a difference in that term. Notice if these two were the same, we would get 10 thirds. But we don't get 10 thirds, so I'm going to use these terms to explain that factor of three. Okay, now unfortunately, we don't have enough information to solve this uniquely. We get a family of solutions. That's actually kind of cool. Uh, this is the one slide version. The moon is spinning, we flatten it, it begins to remember that shape, we synchronize, it begins to pull out towards the, towards the earth and away from the earth, it begins to get that football shape, but it's resisting that change, and so the, the final state is some superposition of those two states. Not, it's not a pure synchronous shape. Okay, well like I said, we can boil this down to tell us a little bit about when did it synchronize and how fast was it spinning at the time that it began to remember its shape. And we're going to uh, write that in terms of the rate of rotation at those two times. So how fast was it initially spinning? That's this. How fast was it spinning when it synchronized? This tells us not only how fast it was spinning when it synchronized, but also how far away from the Earth it was. Because at synchronization, the rotation period and the orbit period are the same. Okay, So we can constrain how far away was it and how fast was it spinning initially. We'll also be able to constrain this difference, which tells us something about how much stronger it got in between those two periods. Okay, like I said, unfortunately, we don't have enough 
information to uniquely determine this, we get a family of solutions. Interestingly, some of them start with a moon that spins faster than synchronous, but some of them start with a moon that spins slower than synchronous. It's actually entirely possible that the moon began spinning quite slowly and the Earth's tidal torques spun it up to synchronous. Synchronous is the steady, is the stable state. And you will go to that whether you start slower or start faster. If you start slower, then the torques spin you up. If you start faster, then the torques <coughs> drag you down. Okay. Either way, it heads towards synchronous. That's this point right here where that line is. We know the moon can't have formed inside the Roche limit. So that's one limit on where it could have formed. And out here, the uh, spring constant, the deformability, can't exceed the deformability of a fluid. The fluid is the maximum, so that's the other limit here. So there's two families of solutions, some of them faster than synchronous, some of them slower than synchronous. All of these satisfy that factor of nine uh, ratio that we observed. Um, okay. What does it take to make this happen? Two things. We gotta change the spin rate of the moon. We gotta drive it to synchronous. Just explain the tidal torques do that, no problem. But the other thing we have to do is we have to cool off the moon. Now the moon is pretty big. It cools off kind of slowly. And the main objection to this idea is that that process is way slower than the process of synchronizing the spin. But it turns out there's a way around that. Um, so we're looking at what, what matters here is the relative rate of rotational evolution, how fast does it spin up or down towards synchronous, versus the rate at which it cools off. Because the cooling off is what allows it to resist deforming into that synchronous shape, ultimately. So we can plot our um, family of solutions on a different diagram. This is the change in rotation rate. How much did the rotation rate change from its initial state where it started to remember its shape to the time it synchronized? This says how much did that strength change? In other words, how much did it cool off? They start here at zero, no change in either one. And if you rapidly spin the body down, well then you move this way on the diagram. Versus if you rapidly cool the body off, you move that way on the diagram. There are actually some contradictory solutions that don't actually make any sense, but it turns out it's virtually impossible to get to those anyway, so I won't worry about them. Um, it turns out that if you want to start with a slow moon and spin it up, you have to cool it off really fast to make that work. But if you start with a initially faster moon, you can get away with relatively rapid rotational evolution compared to the thermal evolution. So those are a little bit more, sen more, sen more sensible. So in other words, the moon really is a fossil. But the cool thing is, it's not just a fossil of the synchronous state, it's the fossil of the pre-synchronous state. And that's kind of neat, because we didn't think that was possible. Um, the current shape is telling us something about the relative rates of rotational evolution and cooling. And that's pretty neat. Um, so there's actually some interesting stuff here in this actually really old uh, observation. Now the primary argument against this idea, against the moon remembering what it was like before it synchronized, is that synchronization should be fast. It should take thousands of years, tens of thousands of years maybe. That is super fast. Okay, that's a really fast process, especially compared to how, how long it takes to cool something off. If you just let the moon sit there and cool, it does not cool very fast by conduction at the surface. Conduction is a very slow process. So is there some way that we can either slow down the spin down or speed up the cooling? And the cool thing is you can do both of them in the same way. And the way that works is that if you have a mostly molten moon, a moon that has a solid surface but is mostly molten inside, it turns out that the tidal torques are actually quite weak. The reason for that is that the tidal torques are coming from a delay or a lag in the response of the tides. That's why the Earth is slowly spinning down, the Moon is slowly moving out, because the Earth's oceans 
are sloshing around, trying to keep up with the moon as it rolls around the Earth every 24 hours. But guess what? They run into continents, they run into shallow seas, they have to force their way in between islands and things, and that slows them down. And so by the time high tide comes, the moon is now over there. The high tide comes late. And as a result, the moon yanks back on that tide, and there's a net torque that slows down the Earth and pushes the moon outwards. Hmm. However, if you have a global ocean, if for example we flattened all the continents and just let, you know, had water world, that tide would just roll right around the earth, chase the moon, it would be very, very close to align with the moon. There'd be nothing to stop it. The fluid is, is fairly rapid in terms of its ability to keep up with the moon versus a solid, versus a partial fluid that has to fight with the solid, which is actually where we are, and that's sort of the worst case scenario. So if we had a global liquid layer, the tidal torques would actually be a lot lower, and it would take a lot longer to spin down. At the same time, magnetic heat transport through the lid, in other words, volcanism, is also a much faster cooling process than conduction is. So the presence of a molten layer within the moon may solve both of these problems together. It lengthens the amount of time it takes to slow it down, and allows you to grow a thick, strong lid that is able to resist de deformation into the shape. This, we'll skip this one. Um, and so one of the neat things, oh, you really want to see the graph? No, we'll skip the graph. Get back, bro. One of the really neat things is, about this is that we have an example of a body that is doing this right now. It's EO. EO is cooling through volcanism at a huge rate, a really fast rate. If, if you turn the rate at which EO is producing new material into a, a resurfacing rate, it is burying itself at one centimeter per year, the entire object. That's really fast. That's growing new, cold, strong material at one centimeter per year. In 10 to the five years, you built a pretty thick lid. You can make a pretty strong lid in that period of time through this kind of mechanism. So if the moon was capable of doing what we see EO doing right now, today, then we may be able to solve both of these problems and make this make this model stand up. So, uh, we'll skip that. No, 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 it's okay. This is, I'm just knocking down straw men. Consider, consider them knocked down. But isn't, isn't the uh, tidal for friction mm -hmm. caused by the tides on EO keeping it hot? Is Correct. That... The moon would not have had that, or at least not for as long and as, as, as intense as EO has had. And thus, as a consequence, the moon has just sort of continued to cool down. EO's tidal heating is so intense that even that rate is just enough to keep up with the amount of heat being produced. And so it's actually in equilibrium um, and is more or less going to stay there for forever. Yeah, that's what I Yeah. Think. But the moon um, did not have that huge internal heat source. And so while it may have transferred heat like this in, for a while, that eventually would have stopped. Yeah. Well, the Earth's core has a lot of uh, radioactive heat. And my question is, has the moon done that? Or is it completely silicon? Um, so the moon has has a radiogenic com complement that is actually pretty much identical to the rocks in the Earth. That's one of the reasons we think the, the Moon and the Earth were formed together through this giant impact event. So yes, the radiogenic heat um, source is there, and it's important, but it actually turns out that for an object the size of the Moon, which remember it's a quarter the size, it's a quarter of the radius of the Earth, and so it's uh, a lot smaller in terms of volume and mass, um, and so as a consequence, that heat source is really not enough to keep it molten for very long. Um, okay, so just to sum up, the moon's shape is a, is a reflection of its rotation on its thermal evolution. Um, I think, and one of these days I will get published, uh, this idea that shows that the moon um, can remember its pre-synchronous state, which is something uh, nobody's really uh, believed up to this point, um, and we can make a coherent story of why it has this odd shape. Um, and that's, I'll take any more questions. I'll, I'll stop my presentation now. Yeah. From your equations and research, 
can you work backwards and find out when and how long ago it became synchronous? Um, so, sort of. Um, that depends on where it starts, uh, like where it actually begins, where it actually forms. If you form it at the Roche limit, um, then it becomes synchronous somewhere on this graph here. It synchronizes at one of these values, somewhere between the Roche limit and out here at five Earth radii. So somewhere in this range, between about three and five Earth radii, which is a pretty narrow range. That's, that's when it synchronizes. It continues to move out due again to that, to the sloshing of tides in the Earth. That's what's causing it to, to move out. Yeah? Well, it's very funny that if the Earth was at five, assume there was a collision Yeah, you're correct. And in, in fact, one of the one of the really neat things about this this problem is that the two bodies evolve together. Um, they're coupled, and so the Earth is generating heat in the Moon and also altering its rotational state. The Moon is actually generating heat within the Earth um, and also altering its rotational state. Uh, so it's actually a pretty neat coupled problem. Um, yes, we get rid of the ocean for a while. Uh, we generate a steam atmosphere and we melt quite a lot of the earth during the giant impact. Um, and then uh, after that, things cool off. It turns out actually relatively quickly, um, geologically speaking, uh, tens of millions of years maybe at most for that steam atmosphere. Um, and then it rains out and we have oceans. But um, within the earth, essentially because the earth is so much larger, um, we can dissipate a lot of energy a lot of tidal energy in the solid part of the Earth, even not just not just the ocean. Today's moon, the dissipation is dominated by the ocean because the Earth has cooled off. But back then, when it was warm, we could have dissipated a lot of tidal energy in the Earth itself, and that also causes the moon to evolve outward. But in detail, yeah, you got to solve those problems together to get a detailed answer. Yeah, um, I'm looking at the problem here. Well, I've always said that the moon of our Earth is so big; it's not you know, it's just uh -huh. it's um, an aberration. It is. Yep. And there's two theories where the uh, Thea hit the Earth and formed the moon and uh, it was captured. Mm -hmm. How about a hybrid between the two? Um, the problem with capture is always um, if the moon is coming in at escape velocity, that's an awful lot of angular momentum you got to scrub off somehow to get into capture to a capture orbit. So, how do you do that? Now, in a sense, Smashing into the Earth does that, <laughs> so so it, in a way it is captured in that sense. Um, it is a captured object in that sense. But the way we typically think of capture means something just short of an actual impact. But anything just short of an actual impact, it's really hard to scrub off that excess angular momentum. Now, one way you can do it, which we actually think might be how Triton got captured uh, at Neptune is to bring in a third body. What if the moon were a binary? We bring them in, they're orbiting each other, and at the time of interaction with the Earth, Earth grabs one and slingshots the other. And so the two of them actually exchange angular momentum. The Earth captures one and throws the other one away. And so it's possible to do that. You gotta line everything up just right. Um, it's actually much easier to do that at Neptune, a body the size of Neptune, than it is to do for a body the size of the Earth. Um, but it is theoretically possible. Yes, you have a follow-up. Well, adding into that, if you have the binary coming in, and you're uh, one of them being Thea and the other one being the uh, uh, mirrored body of the moon, uh, the Earth, uh, the Earth pair. The what? You have, you know, you have two coming in. Yeah. Uh, Right. Oh, one hits and, and we and we capture the other one? Yeah. Well you gotta you still gotta get rid of that extra angular momentum somehow. It's gotta go somewhere. But yes, it could have come in as a binary and I mean maybe both of them hit or or we one shattered one. The other one that was, uh, got captured. Yeah, that's possible. And we built the moon around that one. I guess that's yeah. possible. So. Two questions. One you kept mentioning uh, conduction. Um, like internally I can see conduction and convection mm -hmm. with all the you know magma and whatever was there. Right. But ultimately, isn't it all cooled through radiation? 
Uh, yes, that process is so fast that it's actually conduction through the through the cool <clears throat> through the chilled crust is the limiting step. So that's that's why I focus on that process. I got you. Yeah, so there's convection going on underneath radiation at the surface, which is quite rapid. So it's actually that it's the growth of that lid that actually slows down the heat transfer. Um, very much like a lava flow comes out and it makes a chilled lid, and then you can make a lava tube that goes for miles because it doesn't cool off underneath that lid. Gotcha. Then my next question is, how is it with all the impacts, obviously unless they were perfectly you know, spread out across, that you don't impart some angular velocity on the mass, because, unless they were perfectly scattered, I, 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 what stops it from rotating? So when you build a body out of billions or trillions of other bodies that are all co-orbiting some central primary, right. um, you end up actually canceling out virtually all of the angular momentum because the impacts really are coming in almost completely so randomly. The scatter diagram is so perfectly distributed that it's close it's very close. There is there does tend to be there's a there's a net Keplerian shear, right? The difference in orbital motion between one side of the body and the other side of the body. And that will get imparted to the body typically. Mm -hmm. But what what we find is that in these accretion simulations, it's actually the last two or three hits that matter. All these other small bodies, they all basically cancel each other out, but there's nothing to cancel the last hit. The last big body that comes in is basically what determines the spin rate, or maybe the last two or three big bodies that come in is basically what determines the spin rate. That's more or less why the tilt distribution of the other, of the planets looks like it does. If, if we built the planets out of nothing but really small things, we should expect them to be perfectly straight up and down rotationally with no tilts whatsoever and all relatively slow rotators. But because the accretion process ends with a couple, with basically the biggest object eating the second biggest object, that last hit tends to be what sets the rotational state. And so that can be actually quite a large torque to the, to the rotation rate of the final planet. So we end up with this funny distribution of spins instead of all of them being straight up. So, I'm thinking about asteroids, you know, they sure. slowly rotate at whatever speed because of whatever distribution they got hit back there. Uh, it's just fascinating that throughout the millennia, whatever, it's, I always believe, you know, it's like for every action, there's an equal re reaction. Uh -huh. So why is it if something hit the moon, it would just slowly start turning? I mean, an opposite reaction. Well, it did, but eventually the Earth, the Earth actually takes over as far as the moon goes. The moon's yeah. rotational state is driven almost entirely by the tides of the Earth. You could put the moon at whatever orientation you wanted. The Earth will straighten it out oh, and synchronize. Know. Why? Why? Oh, that's just the tidal torques. That that's the, that's the configuration that minimizes the tidal I know. the tidal torques. Okay, and if you put it in any other configuration, there the dissipation within the moon will, will gradually drive you towards the state that it's in now. That I didn't know. It does somewhat depend on the inclination of the. So is that true for any orbiting object? If the tides are strong enough. Tides meaning. The tides, tides the water tides? The or? tides, well, whichever, with, okay. uh, either within the solid or within the water. But for example, the sun's tides on the Earth have not been enough to drive the Earth to a synchronous state with the sun. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's not strong enough compared to the angular momentum of the Earth, which is very large. Fascinating. <laughs> Thank uh, you. There's a question back here. Okay. Um, it's been a theory that the NASA, when the moon landing, was put up. They put a few mirrors onto the planet, mm -hmm. and the laser measurements show that it's pulling away mm -hmm. from the Earth at about maybe about two millimeters a year, yep, somewhere in that. Yep. Question comes up: How long has that been going on? Ah, very good question. Because if you run that tape backwards, then the Moon is not four and a half billion years old. It's only like two billion years old. So um, the this is all due to this tidal dissipation in the Earth driven again primarily in shallow seas where the, where the, and against continental boundaries where the ocean is trying to follow the tide and it can't. Um, that of course depends very much on the shape of the ocean basins, the geometry of the coastlines, where the continents happen to be at any particular time. Um, so for example, uh, before North and South America came together, there was a gap in there and the tide could just roll right through there. So that was a low dissipation scenario. Right now, however, we have two walls that separate the Atlantic and the Pacific basins. And that's actually a very high dissipation situation. 
um, where the Atlantic has to slosh back and forth, the Pacific has to slosh back and forth, and they, only down in the Drake Passage can the tidal wave you know, make a complete loop without having to stop somewhere and run up against the continent. That's actually a very small uh, strip of the, of the surface of the Earth. And it's actually the equatorial regions are where, where it's dominant. So the Earth today is in a particularly high dissipation state in terms of the geometry of the oceans. And so the moon is moving faster than average right now. But there were other times when the ocean basins had a different geometry and it moved much slower. So that's how, it's, that's how it was able to last that long. Um, as we learn more about the interior of the moon, say in the next hundred years or so, mm -hmm. as far as what kind of composition and structure the inside of the moon looks like and the shape of the inside pieces of the moon, yeah. what kinds of discoveries do you think would help support or disprove um, this particular solution to the problem of the so, so one of the neat things about this is if the moon really is holding up this weird non-equilibrium shape, then there are big stresses in the moon. And we can actually predict the pattern of those stresses in order to maintain this particular shape. And those stresses should be influencing the pattern of moon quakes. So there is tantalizing evidence from the Apollo seismometer uh, experiment, which they turned off after eight years, which drives me nuts, um, even though it would still be running today if they left it on. Um, it had a radioactive battery, it would still be going. Um, so uh, they turned it off because they didn't feel like listening to it anymore. Um, so uh, if we were able to um, do a more, uh, especially a, a better global monitoring system, seismic monitoring system, we would be able to figure out what the stress pattern inside the moon is. Um, because actually, yeah. And in some places, the 12 hour tide actually completely cancels itself out. And you only get one tide a day. The Gulf of Mexico is like that. Costa Rica, I've seen some very high tidal changes there. Okay. And uh, have been all consistent. I was thinking of the northern part of the Gulf Coast. I'm not actually familiar with the, the southern part of the Gulf what the tide the pattern like now. But yeah, and then in other places you'll get a mix. And so in a lot of places, uh, like California's like this, you get a high, high, and then a not so high, high, and then a high, high, and a not so high, high. So that's a combination of the 12 hour and the We get a little bit of that. Yeah, we get a little bit of that. We don't, we're not perfectly symmetric. So yeah, that all has to do with the sloshing of the tide trying to fit into the ocean basin. So in some places it fits better, other places it doesn't. There's also the longer term, the, the annual part, which has to do with the alignment of the orbit of the moon and the sun. We're heading now into the end of October when things line up just right and we get the king tide. So that's when we get the really, the maximum tides, the, the solar tide and the lunar tide line up just right. The tidal boards around the world are getting ready to gear up, I guess. Yes, yes, king tide time is, is good for those. So is this a research project or a thesis or a... Oh, I wrote this up years ago and I, I tried to publish it in a few places and it got kicked back in my face and I just I just sort of shelved it. So I, Are you I waiting for more data, more research, more, or is it just crunching numbers? I, no, honestly, I think I, I just kind of need to repackage it and resubmit it at some point. I just, you know, got, it got the stuck new, on the shelf. new emphasis of moon and all that stuff when it... Well, that might be, that, that yeah, maybe that would be something. I, I got accused of over-interpreting two numbers, i.e. the J2 and the C2. Actually, over-interpreting one number, the ratio of the two things. But... Uh, this is fundamentally important for the moon. This is not a small effect. This is this is the, the stresses involved are huge in order to hold up this weird shape. Yeah, I had a question about the ratio measurement. Actually, measuring the ratio. Do you have to have? Do you physically have to have a mission that's orbiting the body, or like what I'm thinking of is like some of the other moons in the solar system, like the big Saturnian moons or Jupiter moons. Mm -hmm. Like with Galileo going to Jupiter, can you determine a ratio for a moon if you just fly by it, or like with Cassini? Yes, who you can do it with, with multiple flybys. Um, in theory, you can do it with two. Um, if they're very well placed and they both work, they both work just right. You would like to have more. Um, so yes, in fact, I'm actually the person who interpreted those for the Galileo mission. And so we do have constructed the interior structure of those of those objects we based have, on exactly that. Okay, that so approach. we do have the ratio measurements for certain larger moons mm -hmm. 
to a certain error bar. Yep. Right? Yeah. And exactly. Was, and that's, the more flybys you have, the better exactly. your error bar. And so if you've ever seen those, uh, that's okay. If you've ever seen those cutaway pictures of the Galilean moon where you can see the, you know, the core and the mantle and mm -hmm. the ice. Yeah, I made those, and it was based on exactly that. Oh, cool! That measurement. So now, do some of the some of the other um, planetary moons have the deviation like our moon that's nine and should be ten thirds, and it's more like nine? So or are they more like every one of them that we've measured so far looks equilibrium shape, with the slightly possible exception of Callisto of all places. So. Um, Callisto, for some reason, um, it's this is within the error bars, so you know, we can't stand up and, and, and shout it off the rooftops, but it does seem like it might have a slightly non-equilibrium shape, which seems really weird for an object whose surface looks like it hasn't done anything for four and a half billion years. The surface of Callisto looks like it looks, it looks even older than the moon. It is completely saturated. You cannot make a, crisp, a crater on Callisto without destroying an equal number of other craters. <laughs> so there is nowhere to put new craters on Callisto. So it's a very old object um, and somehow maybe seems to not have done much. But again, it's for that particular one, it's within the error bar. All the others seem to be equal to ramp shapes to the extent that we can measure them. Some of them we've actually measured with images by taking images and measuring the elliptical shape. The deviation of the shape. Those tend to not be quite as precise. It's harder to, to make those measurements because we're trying to measure, you know, maybe a kilometer or a kilometer and a half over a thousand versus these these uh, uh, satellite measurements we can make using uh, Doppler shifts of the trajectory. Those can be very precise with uh, with good tracking. Yeah. Uh, one other question, kind of what, from what Matt was talking about. I know what you're focused on here is, is synchronous um, mm -hmm. rotation. Uh, for those moons which you're talking about, for example, that are pretty significantly large, mm -hmm. are there any are there any of them that whose rotation is like a multiple or an integer fraction of their you know orbit around the thing, or it's, that would right. cause a some kind of a you know yeah. persistent pattern? In sure. Shape? So there aren't any. Um, Mercury is actually the only object in a non one to one but still resonant spin orbit configuration. Um, Triton is in an odd configuration, but that's mostly because of its retrograde orbit. Um, so, so Triton's an interesting case, uh, but it is not actually in a resonant uh, rotational state. Resonant was the word. Yeah, the word. resonance is the word. <laughs> yeah, so Mercury has the three to two resonance, but everything else is in one to one. One to one is extremely stable. It's actually hard to get caught in the three to two. Um, again, it's, it requires a good bit of uh, physical strength of the body because you have to maintain a non-spherical shape so that the torques can stop it in that resonance, mm -hmm. right? If it's perfectly spherical, then the, the sun basically has no handles. <laughs> you can't torque it if it's perfectly spherical. So um, you have to have some elastic strength that will maintain a non-spherical shape. And so Mercury evidently managed to do that. But it is harder to trap them in those higher order resonances. They tend to just sort of wander right through them um, because the torques that would catch them there are not quite strong enough. But in Mercury's case, it was. Mercury is mostly a big core with a little bit of crust. Correct, but evidently that crust was strong enough at the time uh, that Mercury passed into the three to two uh, to hold up a, a funny shape. All right, well, great All question. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Bro. Yeah, yeah, my pleasure. Okay, thanks, Bill. We're talking about the group. What was a little movement? All right. Six bucks a piece. And I'll buy some raffle tickets. Yeah, yeah. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Raffle tickets. Raffle tickets, raffle tickets. Give me four. Sean sent me an email while, while Bill was talking. Give me four. Okay. And um, he said something about. Bob Ditt said something about doing a thing of Chesapeake's Planetarium. 
for the uh, Mercury plant. So I don't have any information other than that. There's a lot of trees that are here. There's a lot of trees. Very low horizon. Yeah. Very good at all. Let's do it the big concrete area over or in that Rudy in the Rudy in the thing here? A nice big area to roll by. Is the meeting adjourned other than the travel tickets? Uh, no, that's just the potential. Yeah, um, the, the subscripts are to associate that.